This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Susie Guerin. Brought to you in part by TheStreet.com. Up to the minute stock market news and in depth analysis. Our quant rating service provides objective, independent ratings daily on over 4,300 stocks. Learn more at TheStreet.com slash NBR. Growing stronger, the U.S. economy grows at its fastest pace since early 2012. But is the 3.6% rate as strong as it appears? And why do American businesses still seem so hesitant? Protests over pay, fast food workers strike in the biggest push yet for higher wages. They want $15 an hour. They average around nine bucks now. What a big raise would mean for businesses and consumers. And a sticker shock, why Washington lawmakers could be the reason you pay more, lots more, for milk. We have all that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Thursday, December 5th. Good evening, everyone. Stocks kept sliding today. The losses, though modest, marked the fifth day in a row of declines for the Dow and the S&P 500. That's the longest such streak since late September, just before the government shutdown. Now, despite the sell-off, the indexes are less than 2% from their all-time highs. Today's declines were driven by rekindled concerns that the Federal Reserve might start reducing its $85 billion a month in bond purchases. And it might do it as soon as this month. That's because economic news out today pointed to a strengthening of U.S. growth. The U.S. gross domestic product, the broadest measure of economic output, was, was revised up by more than a half point to 3.6 percent for the summer quarter. That's the quickest pace of growth in a year and a half. Jobless claims fell by 23,000 last week to 298,000, the lowest level in seven years. Meantime, October factory orders did fall 0.9 percent, but that decline was less than forecast. Here are the closing numbers on Wall Street for today. The Dow off 68 points. The Nasdaq down for the S&P 500 lost seven. Treasury sold off on those fears. The market's biggest bond buyer, the Fed, might buy less. The yield on the benchmark 10-year Treasury edged ever closer to 3%. Meanwhile, one top Federal Reserve official gave an upbeat outlook on the economy and said the time is nearing for the central bank to reduce its stimulus program. In a speech today, Atlanta Fed President Dennis Lockhart also said once the Fed does begin tapering, it should plan to completely wind down those massive bond purchases. Investors, he said, should be ready for the program to be done by the end of next year. So how strong is the economy really, and why aren't businesses more confident? Joining us now to answer those questions, Brian Westbury. He's chief economist at First Trust Advisors. Brian, welcome back. Good to have you with us. Let me start, though, with the uh, topic number one of the day, and that is what the Fed may or may not do. If you have the economy growing at 3.6 percent, if you get a good right. jobs number tomorrow, as many anticipate uh, on the heels of the, both the ADP number and the jobless right. claims today, and you have a budget deal that Washington may hit uh, as early as next week, why wouldn't the Fed begin to cut back on buying bonds this month at their next meeting yeah. in week yeah, after I, next? I, I think they will. And I, I, there's only really one reason that they wouldn't. And remember, what the Fed's going to do is they're going to end the purchases of bonds. They're, they'll taper that. It'll take a while to do that. But they want to convince markets they're going to keep the short-term interest rate at zero for a very long time. And, and when you try to do both of those things, it's, it's kind of a complicated process. But I think they're going to try to do it. And as long as they believe they can do that, they'll start very soon uh, with their tapering. Everybody knows that, that quantitative easing was put in during a crisis. And we no longer have a crisis in the United States. So it's time to end this extraordinary monetary policy. You know, Brian, you're pretty upbeat on the economy. A lot of economists are. We hear from Fed officials like Dennis Lockhart today. They're pretty much upbeat on the economy. Right. But it seems like American business CEOs are more cautious. It seems like there's a disconnect. Um, mm -hmm. Why so? Yeah, well, I, I think, gosh, if you look at around us, you know, we've had this year, we had the fiscal cliff at the start of the year. Then we had the sequester kick in. Then we had the, the government shutdown and the debt ceiling debate. And then we've had Obamacare and, and, and all of the issues. Forget the website and all of that. Just the cost. What does it mean for my business? And as a result, there is tons of uncertainty in U.S. businesses. So 
Businesses invested strongly in 2010, again in 11, again in 12, but this year they've slowed up a little bit. Uh, nonetheless, if you look at the cash that businesses have on their books, the profitability of U.S. corporations, they've never been more profitable. Uh, they're hiring. We're going to see a 200,000 job growth in the month of uh, November, probably. And, and that tells me that we're about to see a surge in investment. Boy, if corporations put the cash on their books to work, imagine the kind of surge that we would see. What would it take to get them to... Uh to go put that money to work, number one, and number two, yeah. become more confident. What's it going to take? You know, I, I think right now we're sort of, we keep calling this economy at First Trust, we call it the plow horse economy. It ain't a racehorse. It ain't going to win the Kentucky Derby, but it's not going to keel over and die either. And so right now, business leaders and executives are kind of stuck in the middle. They, they don't see a boom coming but, but they're a little worried about problems, and they're clearly worried about uncertainty with government policy. So what that does is kind of sticks them in the middle. And I think another couple of quarters of, of, of good economic data, more news of positive job growth, and, and you're likely to see that happen. Okay. One other quick thing, and that is it just costs less to buy computers today to make investments. So, so their businesses are investing, but sometimes when we look at just the spending itself, if they're going to spend less on a computer, it may look like they're not, even mm -hmm. though they really are investing. All right, Brian, we've got to leave it there. We'll figure it out. Right. Uh, we'll see what 2014 holds. Brian Westbury, yeah, chief economist at First Trust Advisors. Meanwhile, mortgage rates edged higher this week following encouraging data about new home sales and job growth. The average rate on a 30-year fixed-rate mortgage is now 4.46 percent. That's up from 4.29 percent just last week, according to Freddie Mac. And a year ago, the rate was 3.34 percent. Well, signs of a thaw in federal budget negotiations in Washington. Republican Speaker John Boehner said today he'd entertain a possible extension of emergency unemployment benefits, which are set to expire at the end of the year. But he says the White House has to offer a specific proposal about those benefits and do it in the coming days. Fast food workers across the country were protesting to get paid more. The demonstrations came just a day after President Obama proposed raising the federal minimum wage, part of a push for greater income equality. Workers in 100 U.S. cities called on their corporate bosses to increase wages to as much as $15 an hour. So what would that mean for businesses and for those workers? Hampton Pearson has the story. The biggest push yet for higher pay started early this morning with protests and calls for a fast food worker exodus in more than 100 cities, including very vocal disruptors in Pittsburgh. In Atlanta. And a large crowd on the move in Detroit. McDonald's was the primary target with calls from coast to coast for a supersized minimum wage of $15 an hour more than double the current $7.25 an hour. My checks alone don't even pay my rent a month. So my rent is $1,050. I still get TANF. I still get food stamps. And I'm struggling. If they paid us enough money, you know, during the process of it all, like for what we're doing here today and stuff, then we'll be able to make, a, you know, pay our bills, you know, and, and live a decent life and stuff. McDonald's issued this statement. McDonald's and our owner operators are committed to providing our employees with opportunities to succeed. We offer employees advancement opportunities, competitive pay, and benefits. Today's orchestrated strikes and protests are part of an effort to build momentum to raise the minimum wage by labor unions, Democrats, and advocacy groups. But there will be a big pushback from small businesses and the restaurant industry. Doubling the base wage and driving uh, wage and labor costs up as dramatically as a $15 an hour minimum wage would have a, a very dramatic impact on the cost of goods and uh, workforce uh, planning at restaurants across the country. The protest nationwide had mixed results. Turnouts varied at any given location and it's not certain how many workers actually walked off the job or just how much business was impacted. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Hampton Pearson in Washington. Treasury Secretary Jack Lew says the world's largest economies need to tighten up their financial regulations in order to avoid a repeat of the 2008 financial crisis. Lew wants other countries to meet the high standard of banking rules that have become law in the U.S. 
With the completion of the Volcker Rule, Resolution Authority, and stronger capital and liquidity requirements, the tools of financial reform are being used to make our financial system safer and to hold financial institutions responsible for bearing their own risk without the backstop of public support. Lou heads to Australia in February for a G20 meeting of the world's major industrialized nations. J.P. Morgan Chase is warning nearly half a million holders of prepaid cash cards that their personal information may have been accessed by hackers. The cards were issued by several corporations to pay employees and by some government agencies issuing tax refunds and unemployment benefits. And still ahead, will Twitter's big plan to make more money pay off for shareholders? Or will its new ad strategy potentially backfire? The biggest decliner in the Dow today, Microsoft. Investors dumped shares on hearing that Alan Mulally, the CEO of Ford, may not take the wheel at the software giant. There's been intense speculation that Mulally would step into the CEO job at Microsoft after his contract at Ford runs out at the end of 2014. Here's how Mulally answered our Phil LeBeau, who asked him about taking the top job at Microsoft. I am honored to serve Ford, and we have no change in my plan. I understand that, but you didn't answer my question. Have you been approached? I did answer your question. I am honored to serve for it, and I, there's no change in our plan, and we don't comment on speculation. And you can see the sell-off in the stock. When that question was asked earlier today, shares of Microsoft fell nearly 2.5%. Well, shares of Twitter went the other way today, rising almost 4.5% after announcing some new ads targeting tools designed to give its advertisers a boost and to prove to investors that it can make more money. Well, Julia Borston has the story. Twitter's newest advertising tool targets users based not just on what they tweet about, but also based on the websites they visited. If you visit, say, TripAdvisor, that site, plus any company interested in reaching consumers planning a trip, could show promoted tweets with relevant deals. This approach is particularly valuable because advertisers can reach consumers who have already expressed an interest in making a particular purchase, and it's reaching them both online and on mobile devices, key because mobile is the fastest growing ad category. Because the ads are more targeted, um, advertisers are going to be willing to pay more uh, per impression. Um, that means uh, greater revenue for the ad inventory that Twitter has available. Um, and it means better performance for advertisers. AdRoll, which specializes in targeting ads and is partnering with Twitter on this new approach, says that when testing Twitter's new product, it saw twice the engagement rate as in prior Twitter ad campaigns. But not everyone is bullish. S&P analyst Scott Kessler says it remains to be seen whether marketers will buy into the ad format and whether consumers will opt out of the targeting. But there's no debating. This shows Twitter is serious about improving its ads. AdRoll, which also partners with Facebook on its targeting, says this will give Twitter a big boost. Facebook has a similar product available, um, and it's been very effective um, in driving direct response um, on Facebook. Um, and I, from the results that we're seeing, uh, they're very analogous uh, on Twitter as well. Now we'll see whether better targeting helps Twitter gain on much larger rival Facebook. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borston in Los Angeles. Also more on Twitter, it announced today its first female board member. She's 66-year-old Marjorie Scardino, the former CEO of Pearson. This is the publishing and education company. Twitter was sharply criticized for not having any female directors on its all-white male board. The news came by tweet, and Scardino responded with her first tweet, saying it's an exciting time in Twitter's history. Today is the 17th anniversary of Alan Greenspan's irrational exuberance comment. Remember that? It was about sharply rising stock prices. So how much has changed in the markets since then? And what companies right now may be seeing a little exuberance in share prices, even if their bottom lines show a different story? Dominic Chu has more. 
17 years ago, two words were forever etched into the history books of financial markets, irrational exuberance. How do we know when irrational exuberance has unduly escalated asset values, which then become subject to unexpected and prolonged contractions. Former Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan used the term to characterize what could be a frothy and overvalued market. Things back then weren't all that different than they are now. Sure, the S&P 500 was trading at around 745 points back in December of 1996 and trading at close to 1,800 today, but valuations today are close to what they were back in 1996. There are still some companies that investors may be irrationally exuberant over. Take a company like Pandora. The internet radio company is up more than 200% this year and only managed to eke out a profit in two of the last four quarters. Solar City, the renewable energy company, has more than quadrupled in value, but has yet to turn a profit since going public last year. But some experts say that just because profits are not flowing now doesn't mean they won't flow in the future. A lot of these companies are investing extremely uh, large amounts of money in their business and that's why they're creating losses. But investors have to be able to see a light at the end of the tunnel in terms of profitability. If that light is not going to come, then these valuations are not even close to being substantiated. It's also worth noting that the stock market didn't reach a tech bubble peak until over three years after Greenspan expressed his concerns about irrational exuberance. That's why some traders think the market still has room to run. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Dominic Chu. There was a run-up in shares of Time Warner Cable right before the closing bell today, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. Just before 4 o'clock Eastern time, it was reported that the cable op operator would likely accept a $150 to $160 billion buyout offer. No word yet on who the buyer might be, but there's been recent speculation that Cox Communications, Charter, and Comcast are interested. Comcast is the parent of CNBC, which produces this program. After the spike, shares of Time Warner Cable erased raised most of those gains, closing at $132 and change, up a fraction. JCPenney's stock fell sharply because of a research note from Wells Fargo today. Analysts from the investment firm said, although Penny's sales recently jumped by 10 percent, that may be as good as it gets. Shares of the struggling retailer tumbled 8 percent to $8.85. Apple hitting a 52-week high. Shares rose on yet another report, this one from the Wall Street Journal, that it had signed a deal with China Mobile to carry the iPhone starting in mid-December. China Mobile is the world's largest mobile phone carrier in terms of subscribers. The stock closed at $567.90. That was up a half percent. Costco's November sales missed expectations, its weakest month since September of 2009. The warehouse retailer said sales were soft in its consumer electronics and lawn and garden businesses, while sales of office, apparel, and small appliances were stronger. The stock fell more than 1 percent to $120. $120.95. Tyler? Well, Dollar General reported earnings that beat Wall Street estimates despite what it calls a challenging consumer environment. The discount retailer's profits have grown steadily as it opens new stores and attracts cost-conscious shoppers. Dollar General also added a billion dollars to its stock buyback program shares up 6 percent on this otherwise uh, sort of soggy day, 59.81, the close. Kroger, the biggest U.S. supermarket operator, issuing a cautious outlook for the rest of the year. The company reported earnings in line with estimates, but it's still concerned about cuts to the food stamp program and how it will ultimately impact the current quarter. The stock dropped 3.5 percent, 40.06, the finish there. Mattress firm beat earnings and revenue estimates and said it uh, has raised its ye full year sales guidance. The company, which sells national mattress brands such as Sealy and Simmons, said increased advertising is helping to drive customer traffic and sales growth. The stock rose almost 14 percent to $38.90. Meantime, shares of Electronic Arts falling sharply today after the company said that ongoing problems with its Battlefield 4 game forced the delay of future games from its developer. Uh, the issues including the game crashing repeatedly and problems accessing downloadable content. Battlefield is one of Electronic Arts's biggest franchises. The stock off almost 6 percent to $21 and a penny. Here's a budget buster for a lot of families. Can you imagine paying seven or even eight dollars for a gallon of milk? Well, those scary dairy prices could happen unless Congress passes a new farm bill by the end of this year. 
Jackie DeAngelis takes a closer look at the legislation and the impact on companies, farmers, and consumers. Chances are you've heard of the fiscal cliff, but have you heard of the dairy cliff? The dairy cliff refers to changes in farm policy that could send milk prices skyrocketing from an average of $3.46 a gallon now to $7 or $8 a gallon after the new year. So what's behind it and why does it matter? Well, it all started with a farm bill that was passed in 1949. The 1949 farm bill is permanent law. That's our permanent farm bill. And we've had extensions on the 1949 law um, every several years. And the most recent one being in 2008, we had a five-year extension that Congress put through. And now here we are again at that deadline uh, that will expire on January 1st and could drive uh, milk prices much, much higher and dairy prices much, much higher if it expires. The problem with the antiquated law is that it was implemented at a time when the dairy industry was smaller and less efficient, so it received bigger subsidies from the federal government. If the U.S. reverts to that policy, taxpayers will foot the bill of those subsidies to the tune of an extra $12 billion, according to experts. And while consumers could see a big sticker shock for milk at the grocery store, the impact would be much more than just milk. The impasse would also impact food producers that use dairy in their finished products. Think butter and margarine producers like Land O'Lakes, yogurt companies like Dannon, Shabani, Stonyfield, cream cheese and sour cream companies, then there are the packaged food makers, General Mills, Pinnacle Foods, ConAgra, Mondelez, who all use various forms of dairy as ingredients as well. Farmers are worried that high prices could make customers cut back on all dairy products. Initially, people would be, probably would be buying it and farmers would benefit for a very short period of time and then demand destruction would set in and we would likely see prices come back down. And this isn't the first time that we faced the dairy cliff. It happened last year, but Congress was able to pass an extension. Analysts are hoping that we could get a 12-month or 24-month extension this time around as well to keep milk prices in check. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Jackie DeAngelis. And still ahead, the passing of one of the world's most inspiring leaders coming up. And finally tonight, Nelson Mandela of South Africa has died. Mandela spent nearly three decades in prison for his crusades against South Africa's white supremacist apartheid government. By the time he was released in 1990, his country had become an international outcast. By 1994, with apartheid painstakingly dismantled, Mandela had been elected president. President Obama had this to say earlier this evening. We've lost one of the most influential, courageous, and profoundly good human beings that any of us will share time with on this earth. Through his fierce dignity and unbending will to sacrifice his own freedom for the freedom of others, Madiba transformed South Africa and moved all of us. Nelson Mandela, his country's George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, dead tonight at 95. He was up there with Nehru and Gandhi and Churchill among the 20th you know, he, century's he greatest. He was not a, only a great leader for his country, but also he was such a role model for the world. Absolutely. And uh, he will sorely An inspiring man. inspiring life story. And thank you for watching Nightly Business Re Report. I'm Susie Garibald. And I'm tomorrow. Tyler Matheson. Thank you very much. We'll see you back here tomorrow night. Nightly Business Report has been brought to you in part by TheStreet.com, up-to-the-minute stock market news and in-depth analysis. Our quant rating service provides objective, independent ratings daily on over 4,300 stocks. Learn more at TheStreet.com slash NBR.
I'm Susie Garrett with a nightly business report news brief. More red ink on Wall Street today. The Dow and S&P fell for the fifth day in a row, the longest losing streak since late September, just before the government shutdown. Today's declines were driven by fresh concerns that the Federal Reserve might start reducing its massive stimulus program as soon as this month. The reason for the concern, more strong data about the U.S. economy, a sharp drop in jobless claims and a spike in the nation's gross domestic product, which rose more than 3.5% over the summer. The Dow fell 68 points, the Nasdaq was down 4, and the S&P lost 7 points. And fast food workers in 100 U.S. cities took to the streets today, pushing to increase wages to as much as $15 an hour. Be sure to tune into Nightly Business Report right here on your public television station.